going to start out to see how many people this is the first one of these meetings you've been to. I said the first one. Really? Thank you very much. Wow. Uh, I don't know, did you, were you a little surprised that there had that many new people in the room? Yeah. A lot of the faces I recognized, but a lot of them I didn't. Uh, since there are so many people in the room, room and you had not seen this presentation before, so you won't be as bored as the other half of the room. So. It is always a pleasure to come down here and talk to you guys. Uh, I am with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I am the federal government. I am here to help you. Um, <laughs> I didn't have a I didn't have a place for a laugh pause, <laughs> but uh, it always is a pleasure to come down here. I guess I've been here since the beginning. Uh, it is always always a pleasure to come down here and talk about motorcycle safety. Uh, I am a rider. I think that's an important aspect of the program. I think that the message goes a lot better to bikers if it's coming from bikers. I've been around this environment long enough to know that unless you're a biker, you're probably a biker you're not going to listen to. What's the first thing they're going to tell you? You're don't know what, yeah, you don't ride, you don't know what you're talking about, right? Well, I've been riding since 1974. I haven't kept up the mileage, but I know it's hundreds of thousands of miles. Fortunately, none of those have been serious. Uh, a couple of little scrapes here and there. Uh, I think I'm a very defensive rider. I do like, I like variety. These are my tur current two bikes. I, I owned every type of motorcycle you had, except for a super sport. And I said, well, you know, before I get too old, I need to start that. So I, I bought a Kawasaki ZX-14 last year, and I'm, I'm enjoying that for, for running around. And, and then I take the Gold Wing. I've traveled probably at least two-thirds of the United States on my motorcycle. And uh, I'm one of those that don't believe that you can't count the state if you trailer it there. <laughs> so, you know, you need to leave from your house, on your bike, go do what you're going to do, and come home on your bike. So all those, all of those, I have rode from home. And, made it back and once again no breakdowns no crashes and I've, I've had some wonderful trips out there we all like to go out and have a good time unfortunately i think for most of the non-riders out there i think this is kind of who we are right you know no matter what you do or what you ride if you're if you're in a cage this is what everybody you knows this is not orange so it's not me um but most previous like I did have a black Kawasaki Concord, so, uh, but, you know, that's, that's kind of the image that we have, unfortunately, with a lot of the public, is because there are small, a few uh, bad apples that are going down the interstate, popping willies at 80 to 90 miles an hour, and so we have to over, overcome that, that attitude that the general public has, because I, I think, quite frankly, I think a lot of the general public, you know, they're like, big deal, crazy bikers. They, you know, they're out there riding these bikes, and they're riding aggressive, and they're doing crazy stuff, so what happens if they crash, you know? And I, I think that's the, something that we, as, as the motorcycle community, we're, we're constantly having to work with to overcome, is that attitude of the general public. And do we need the support of the general public? Yeah. We do. Because if we don't have that support, unfortunately, a lot of times the funding for what our safety programs are are, are not there also. Uh, she did throw up a lot of the 2014 statistics. Generally what I do is I kind of give you a little history and show you some of the trend lines on what's going on in motor safe, motorcycle safety across the country. And then I'll update you what NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, is also doing as far as research projects. And we're going to go ahead and do that. Here's what I had for the Texas Motorcycle Fatalities. I think my and Melissa's numbers were a little bit off. Are a little bit different. Uh, she's probably coming from the state reporting system. We're coming from the fatal analysis reporting system that is maintained by the NHTSA and is kind of a premier national reporting uh, organization. I was excited to see 2014. That's not hit our system yet. What was that number in 2014? Who remembers? 421. Do you have memory? You write that down. Okay, good. Well, either way, it works. All right. But what is that? How does that compare to uh, 2013? is very significant. Uh, you know, I, I'm kind of anxious. Anybody know why? why? <laughs> I'd love to know. You, you know, you got that silver bullet that called, can tell me why, why we had 70 less? I'd love to know, because I'm not really sure. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, when did DJ get here? <laughs> DJ got here in 2013? Okay, well, there it is. Uh, 
I, I can't tell you when you kind of look at the chart here, well, we had some reductions in 09 and, and, and 10, but we, we kind of know what caused those, right? Yes, yeah, I mean, the, the economy of the United States was really bad, and I think a lot of people that either couldn't afford their motorcycles, they sold their motorcycles, or whatever. And so I think that's what drove 09 and, uh, <coughs> 09 and 10. And then we kind of started creeping back up to those numbers that we're at now. So I'm excited about those reductions in Texas. And what, I'm certainly hoping that trend line continues that way. <coughs> Here's the number of crashes. It's kind of fairly consistent, too. We did see a dip in there in 2010 of crashes in Texas. But it came back up and we're a little bit, pretty good trend uh, drop there from 2012 to 2013. I don't know if you reported total crashes. Did you? I didn't see that. Just the tallies. I didn't see the crash numbers for 2014. So it's look forward to seeing and hoping that trend, of course, is the same. Texas motorcycle fatalities, percentage of the national. I always put this up here because I want to tell you, Texas, you drive a lot of the national. Okay? What percentage is Texas of all the fatalities in the United States motorcycle? Are we pretty consistent? <laughs> yeah, I, when I look back, it's 10%, 10%. Now, it may have been 9.58, 9 you know, but it's always sitting there right at 10%. So that number is constantly coming up. You know, the Texas is driving a large part of it. Now, here in Texas, we're blessed, right? Yes. Sir. What can we do in Texas? Ride here. Ride here around, Dad. We ain't putting our bikes up in September and getting them out in May. And that gives us a much longer riding season. So we do have a large number of it. To make the numbers go out in the nation, Texas, we need to be a leader because we need to drive those numbers down since right now one out of every 10 is a Texan. Motorcycle fatality is not helmet abuse. She hit that. Texas have a helmet law. Nope. Kind of, sort of, partial. Somewhat. Yes. But when I noticed when Melissa put it up, she used the positive side of it. So many people did use helmet. I always put the negative side up. So how many people didn't use helmet? And if you look right across that bottom white line, you're talking about we're somewhere around 60 to high 50, you know, 50 percent of the time the person that's killed in a crash doesn't have a helmet on. Now I know to a large percentage you I am preaching to the choir. If I really had people raise hands, you wear your helmets every time, all the time. I imagine 80, 90 percent of this group, because you're the you're the safety trainers, would say yes. You know, that's, that's just the group. But we know that a large percentage of the motorcyclists out there choose not to wear the helmets, and that's their choice. But we also know that's probably the most number one safety feature that you're ever going to be able to use on a motorcycle is that helmet. Protect that head. And so they are not being used a lot of time, and a lot of time those crashes are resulting in fatalities in the state of Texas. Just put this up there, general interest. You can kind of look at the map and see where the states are that have the helmet laws, which ones don't. Which of them have a partial with from younger age uh, riders? Yeah, you know, we got a pretty big trend across the South. Purple is the ones with a uh, with a hit primary helmet law, and then the scatterboard kind of like, like Texas, you know, where we require either you know under 20 or under 17, and then you got a number of states that have, a few states that have absolutely none. National non helmet use. Just kind of threw these numbers up to show how many fatalities were happening nationwide compared to, to the rest of the country. Now, what was Texas' percentage of uh, people dying without helmet? <laughs> so what? We're about 20% higher than the national average. And that probably is offset by a, a number of those states that do have primary health laws. So. All right, Melissa also touched on deaths. I went ahead and set it up by age group so you can kind of see how it falls out. Uh, 2029 20, still comes out at the top, probably because they may be a little bit more in the risk taker category than, than some of us, but you know, I've seen some of you guys ride, so maybe. Um, but, you know, surprise or not, look at, the, look at the demographics in this room on the riders. Anybody in here under 30? So, I mean, it's not, but not you know, a couple here and there, but. There's a lot of us guys in the, in the uh, you know, 25 and, I mean, 30 and up age group still riding. And, and those numbers come up. If you look 40 to 49, not that far behind the, uh, the, the 20-year-olds. And then 50, 59, they're still pretty up, uh, high up there, too. So demographics are a number of people out there riding that are older. 
and, and either getting back or someone like me who's been riding pretty consistently for, gosh, I guess that's getting close to 40 years, dude. Ugh. I can't, I can't I help. Feel pain, but... getting, getting kind of old. Kind of wanted to also show you, we did talk about in fair driving, that our, my region, Region 6, is made up of five states and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. I didn't put any BIA statistics up because really motorcycle fatalities on Indian reservations are very low. But once again, when you look at these numbers on that number of killed, who's driving the number for the state of, for the Region 6? Texas. You're big. You got a big population. You got a lot of people riding motorcycles. I think somewhere over 430,000. Registered motorcyclists, is that right? So 493. And, and and one half. You know, so so uh, so there's a lot of us out there. And so so we've got big numbers. This also kind of really gives you a breakdown on the impaired driving. And it's very consistent with what she said over this is from 2012. But when you look at any BAC showing up in the system, whether it's 0 0.01, 0 0.07, 0 0.08, and above. You've got 45% of the fatalities that are falling, that are dying here in the state of Texas with some measurable alcohol in their system. Now, how many, anybody here think riding and drinking it really works well? I don't. I think as soon as you start drinking, that's when you ought to take the keys and lose them because you don't need to be getting on your motorcycle. You don't need to drive a car, you don't drive, definitely don't need to drive a motorcycle. But unfortunately, there are a number of people that choose to do that. And unfortunately, there is a culture you know, in a number of areas in the you know, groups and right groups, drinking goes along with riding. You know, I've done, I've done the poker runs and stuff, and where, where do a lot of those stop? A lot of times, that's the stop. Ride a group, go in, get your, get your, your car, have a beer, two beers, then you go on to the next one. Well, you know, you got three, four, five stops. You got a six pack or more under your belt before you ever get to the end, and hopefully, I do hope that they do make it to the end. Texas MC single vehicle crashes. You know, I always think this is interesting because I've been working with motorcyclists for a long time with this group, and a lot of times the number one thing that motorcyclists always complain about is who? Those cages. Who, who kills us? It's not our fault, right? It's not the biker's fault. Are we at fault sometimes? Oh, yeah. Sir. Oh, yeah. We all make mistakes. We're going to do things that are not smart, and we're going to get involved in crashes. But we cannot take and transfer all responsibility for those crashes and those fatalities to others. You know? And when you look at 44% in 2012 were single vehicle crashes, that tells me that a lot of times that motorcycles are responsible for that. Now, I'm, t I'm telling you, there's people out there that would say, well, Ken, it was a car ran them off the road. And, I, and I, I grab it. I'll, I'll give you that argument on, on some of those crashes. But once again, I can't, don't think you can ignore the percentages and the numbers that are coming out. 44% single vehicle, 45% impaired driving. Sometimes motorcyclists, we the riders, are going to have to accept responsibility for what's going on there. And we want to clean up our house and do our things to the, as safe as we can be before we start going out there and complaining to others about what's going on in the safety. These are from 2012, these are some charts. This, this is all available on, on our system, Fatal Announcement Reporting System on NHTSA's website. This comes up each year. Each year showing the different locations and the number of fatalities. There's really not anything surprising here. No, the high numbers are large population densities generally. Uh, about Fort Stockton area seems a little bit high, but we know that's the destination place. A lot of people go out and ride the mountains and stuff. So those numbers are pretty close. I want to try to go ahead and give you kind of an update of, of what kind of research and what things NHTSA is doing out there to, to help do it, uh, improve the situation. We are looking at trying to figure out some strategies for uh, addressing impaired riding and what kind of enforcement might be, be done. Uh, motorcyclists never want to be singled out by law enforcement, and, but when there's a large number of motorcyclists dying from impaired driving, there may be a need to figure out a better way to enforce impaired driving on motorcycle. So that study is going on now. I hope that that's going to be out in the fall of 2016. I will kind of uh, tell you that unfortunately, every year I go to our, our people in Washington and say, hey, give me an update of all these research policies, all these research programs. I've got to give them 
uh, an update of what happened since last year. And I can tell you, it says fall of 2016, but it may get bumped, bumped to fall of 2017. Because that's what happens to a lot of these projects as I go and get, get the uh, updated information. They've been bumped, they're running a little bit longer, and the review process sometimes is very difficult. State adoption of the model national standards for rider training, working on how to standardize that across the country. That's supposed to be out in spring of 2016. I'm actually seeing both of my slides up here, and sometimes I'm confused, like, wait, that's not it. <laughs> uh, motorcycle operator manual and knowledge test question database. This is kind of working with uh, some people to try to develop some standardization in that area. That should be coming out in the spring of 2015. Law enforcement training. We're trying to train law enforcement better about how they should be involved in motorcycle safety. That report should be out in the spring of 2015. Update on the implementation guide for the National Agenda for Motorcycle Safety. I've been waiting for this report for two years. I worried, worried the heck out of it. So we're getting an update, man. You keep, you keep telling us it's coming. Well, now it's supposed to be out any time. But we're certainly hoping that will that'll, that'll be out soon. Models national standards for entry-level rider training. There was a study that did come out. Any of y'all that want to look at any of the studies that have complete, the most important number that you can write down is the 811502. If you'll Google that number, uh, NHTSA study or whatever, put that that, that uh, number in, generally it would come up. I wish I could say it was easy to find on the NHTSA website, but unfortunately I have trouble finding the stuff on there. I use Google as much as anything else to find the, our studies. So just put that number in. If you want to see any of the studies that I'm going to show you today, that number, put it in there. A review of the state of knowledge and revised work plan. They're going back, uh, University of North Carolina is going to go through and do a big study of all the stuff that's been written out there in motorcycle safety over the years and, and kind of figure out where do we go from here type of thing. So they're hoping they'll be able to have that by the summer of 2016. Instrumented on-road study of motorcycle riders. This is one I'm kind of interested in. I, I, at one point I was kind of like, well, you know, it'd be probably pretty cool to be one of the 160 participants that I was I thought about it a little bit more. I'm like, maybe I don't want them knowing what I do all the time. <laughs> I do work for NHTSA. Um, and so there are, but there are 160 uh, bikers that have uh, their uh, equipment all computerized. And so pretty much everything they're doing while they're riding is being recorded and, and put into the computer system for evaluation and analysis later on. And so I'm kind of anxious to see what it kind of shows, you know. Uh, and, on how people really do ride. You know, you can go ask them about how you ride, do you ride safely, they tell you one thing, but this is going to tell you, tell you what really what's going on. Then we've had a lot of discussions on this, the effect of entry level motorcycle rider training on motorcycle crashes. You know, everybody says, well, we know motorcycle safety training improves safety, but I don't think we've had anything for sure that kind of proved that. And so there's supposed to be a study coming out that where they evaluated people that had the training, people that didn't have the training. See what those, those numbers actually show. Examination of Washington State's vehicle impoundment law for motorcycle endorsement. This is a study that has been completed. The number you want there is at 811698. So if you want to go back and see if uh, impounding motorcycles in the state of Washington have actually did help them improve their motorcycle safety, that would be where you could go. Examination of the Puerto Rico.02 BAC law for motorcycle riders. This study has been completed. Uh, they're in the pro process of uh, working up the final report. I, as a motorcyclist, as a safety advocate, I would very much support reducing BAC for uh, motorcyclists. I know it's a very hot topic when you start talking to the biking community about being selected, but you know, we do it already for commercial motor vehicle operators. They're, they're currently at 0.04. You know, personally, I wouldn't believe it would be any problem moving motorcyclists from zero, zero, zero. Uh, but they are looking at whether or not when Puerto Rico did go to a point of two, did that really help uh, reduce impaired motorcycle? Examination of feasibility of alcohol interlocks on motorcycles. What do y'all think? Yes, no, maybe? No. No. Okay. Got, got an opinion on why? Um, 
I had a devotion to that one, and the previous one is when we start segmenting motorcycles out from the general population. But they provide interlocks on cars now. Put it on, put it on all vehicles. If you want to raise the BAC level down to point four, do it across all vehicles. They, they, uh, they currently do interlocks on people. A lot of these states have different criteria that puts them in, into them. So I think they want to start determine whether or not can motorcyclists also be included into that criteria. I can tell you that I actually did go and watch one of the uh, interlock companies put one on a motorcycle. It's not that hard. I was really surprised at how easy you, you, uh, you got to have a little place for a little black box. Uh, of course, the one thing that I would, would not agree with is a rolling retest. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a very good idea, but I did hear there was a story, I think California had were putting some on some motorcycles and they did re still require a rolling retest. So one guy was very creative and ran tubing up through his jacket and into his helmet. So, and so, he, was, so he had it set up where he could actually you know, provide a specimen. Uh, but you know, I don't think it's that big, big a deal if you did have to stop pull to the side of the road and, and safely provide a, a specimen. Influential factors on helmet uses. This is another one I think is going to be pretty interesting to see. They're currently doing a study looking around the country at uh, states that do not have helmet laws to see what their helmet utilization rate is. And then they're trying to determine if they're doing things in that state that help increase helmet use without a helmet law. So I'm kind of really anxious to see kind of how this one comes out. And this would be one of the things like the state of Texas could use to, you know, implement some of the things those other states are doing to, to increase the volunteer, uh, voluntary helmet utilization. Uh, this is a study of different publications and reports that have been done. I'll leave it up here for a second. Like I said, if you're jotting down these numbers, these are the different ones that you want to do. You can look at daytime running lines, uh, making yourself more uh, visible. I always have trouble with conspicuity. That's a big word for me. I don't know why I always struggle with it, but I do. Uh, I personally believe very strongly in that. You know, I look, I look at several of the guys coming here. Here's a nice high biz yellow helmet right here. You know, you're going out, you're riding all, motor, all black motorcycle and all black gear. Uh, I'm telling you, you just don't show up as much, you know. Put some, put some, stuff, put some stuff on that, that makes you stand out from the crowd. I'm, I'm big into it to the lime greens and the oranges and the colors, you know, because that's what makes you stand out with all that other traffic out there. So, so make yourself uh, a bigger target so that they, they'll see you out there. Everybody got your, all the numbers they want to help you? <coughs> a study of motorcycle rider braking control behavior, that one is finished. You want to go see, see what, they, what they said about how people uh, utilize their brakes when they're when they're braking. Go to this, look at this study, 811448. It is out. Uh, my office is in Fort Worth, Texas. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm one of you, part of the team. I'm not. I'm not. I may be a fed, but I'm also a biker, and I want I want all my friends to get home safely. I believe one of the things that we've got to do is, as a community, though, is we've got to to get the Biker, uh, biker community to buy in on the safety. You know, I, I think that there's a lot of times that we're, the messaging that we're giving is not resonating with uh, I think that we're, we're going to have to get the bikers to say, we want my brothers to be safe. Because you, those of you who ride know that riding is a brotherhood, right? No matter if you're in a club, you still got that relationship with the other bikers. What, what do all bikers do when they go by? Wait. Get a, you get a little wave. Hey, brother, how you doing? That's that acknowledgement of, yeah, we've got a connection. And that, that grows a lot more as you go out into the community. Everybody, pretty much, even if you're not in a patch club, you've got that three, four, five guys you ride with, right? There's a few people that might not have any friends. <laughs> you know, they, they go out there and ride by themselves all the time. But generally, they, you're going out there as a community. You're gonna, you're gonna call your two or three buddies up and go, hey, let's go do a lunch run. Let's go do a drive through the, whatever your road is down here that you're gonna hit with all the curves, you know? So y'all gonna go out and spend the day. And we, we've gotta get them to, to understand that you know you are responsible for your brother. You know, so bikers need to understand that their brothers are part of their family and they need to do whatever they gotta do to protect them. So that includes from the first moment 
they start planning a ride or get together or a party, they need to start figuring out how are we going to address this? Is alcohol going to be here? Are we going to have some provisions for getting people home, for locking up their bikes, for making sure that they're safe in, this, in the situation? It's because I think that's important for them to have that buy-in and understand, yeah, I'm responsible for my bike or brother and I'm going to do whatever I've got to do in this situation to, to make it happen. I appreciate the opportunity to come down and talk. I'll be here for most of the rest of the day and I thank you very much.